there any relevance of native speaker norms? That's a question for tephalologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for tephalologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? From feedback to learner autonomy, we'll discuss it all on Tephalology. Hi, Matthew. I'm Rob. I'm Matt. And I'm Richard. And welcome back to the Tephalology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by four self-certified Tephalologists. Tefl Cultures. Okay, so for this week's Tefl Cultures, um, as you may have guessed, we have a we have a guest with us um, <laughs> in the shape of Richard Pinner. Um, so but not actually Richard Pinner, just in the shape <laughs> of him. <laughs> so this is actually my section, technically. Although we're going to hand over to Richard, and Richard's going to do this section for us. So um, well, for you. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard, what have you got? Uh, hi guys. So yeah, I, thanks for having me on the show again. Uh, as you know, I'm a big fan. Do you, do you want to briefly introduce yourself again for listeners who might not remember your previous uh, appearance? So I was on three years ago talking about authenticity, mm-hmm. and I've come back to, I don't know, <laughs> mess with everyone's minds again uh, by talking about complexity uh, in, um, uh, well, complexity as a kind of research paradigm in uh, language research. Mm. So what... <laughs> What do you guys know about complexity? Uh, is, it, is, is it like there's a pile of sand and the, and the sand goes on top of the pile of sand and you can't predict where the sand will... Something like that? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of the metaphors used to explain complexity, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. well, when I, when I saw this book here, I thought you were going to be telling us about language complexity. Mm. Um, which is nothing like this at all, is it really? You know the you know the uh, complexity, accuracy, and fluency. Mm-hmm. But that's not what you're talking about. Oh right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Complexity is in like how kind of related to vocabulary yeah, and the type sure. of vocabulary yeah. people yeah. use. Yeah. yeah, I do. I actually have a, a rubric that says complexity on it, which is totally different okay. to okay. to okay. that. But yeah, yeah, that's that's, that, all, that's okay. one of the associations. Okay, so it's not that one. <laughs> no. So this is complexity in uh, language research, or uh, well, yeah, basically it's complexity as a kind of paradigm, you know, as a way of approaching research. So mm-hmm. um, no, I, my under- so I've seen on a few um, like Facebook posts and things like the ITEFL discussions is one that sticks uh, that comes to mind. Uh, people discussing complexity as a, as a research method uh, for language teaching and, and people having a kind of negative reaction to it and thinking, Ugh, that sounds horrible and um, also it doesn't sound useful and it, isn't it all just some new fashionable way of getting cranking out you know, really inaccessible looking papers with crazy graphs and statistics. So um, basically, the answer that's the kind of that's the if if people who know about complexity uh, theory and complexity uh, research probably you know might have that image because a lot of the um, stuff around complexity is 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 also complicated as well. But complicated and complexity are, are two different things. So b- simply, complexity basically means that something is so dependent on relational parts and context and other sort of factors mm. that you can't really isolate um, you know, one thing and just study it, but you have to look at its relationship to other things within a system, and it's kind of you know, moving and dynamic. So that's the kind of the simple explanation of complexity. At, at this stage, can I, can I kind of ask for a few examples of... Of that? Yeah, that, I'm really glad you said that. So um, one example that uh, where complexity theory kind of was first applied was meteorology. So the weather is a mm. complex uh, system because, um, you know, if it rains in Argentina, that can make an effect on the weather in Chile. And then, you know, mm-hmm. let's say um, there's always that. The very famous example is that 
a kind of butterfly flapping its wings. In China, might create a hurricane somewhere else. So, would would proponents of complexity theory say that there's there's no point in focusing just on one factor? Like that's that's worthless. Ah, uh, yeah. No, that's a good good question there. So, I think that um, what what you what they try to avoid is is focusing on one factor in isolation. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you're looking at someone's acquisition of a certain grammar structure, for example, then uh, complexity researchers would, would want to know m- more about the context and they'd want to know more about what else is happening. Mm-hmm. And so uh, this is my interest in, in complexity theory, really, for, for doing research, because um, although it, there's a lot of sort of scientific... Um, and people use computa- computers and modeling and that kind of thing to predict complex systems. But when you're looking at social uh, social things like language learning, mm-hmm. um, then the, the, the kind of research that people tend to do will have to be kind of more qualitative in nature and um, focusing, like trying to get to know people in context mm-hmm. rather than to sort of make people um, see them as a, a list of numbers or mm-hmm. categories or that kind of thing. Yeah. You, you mentioned qualitative approaches. So what, what specific um, procedures would these researchers go about using in terms of investigating complexity? Would it be case studies or ethnographies or what, what kind of things would they do? Yes, yeah, so, so um, basically uh, one of the most famous books on complexity in language learning is by um, Dan Larson Freeman and Deborah Cameron. And although that book, uh, I've heard from colleagues, uh, that book can be kind of a little bit inaccessible because it does have some, uh, you know, um, very technical aspects to it. What they what they say for kind of research, uh, you know, how to conduct research is really emphasizing classroom-based research. So teachers doing research themselves and um, you know, people going in and, and seeing kind of language learning in the field rather than getting students into a laboratory and, and sort of teaching them made up words and then testing them for acquisition and that kind of thing, actually just getting into classrooms and getting teachers to do research and introspective techniques. So looking backwards at your uh, teaching and, you know, journals, that kind of thing. Um, but also observations and, as you say, uh, case studies, um, ethnographies. Doesn't that that focus on the classroom cut off some of the complexity? Because, you know, like learners are influenced by all the other stuff going on in their lives outside the classroom. Mm. So at what point do you decide that's enough complexity for me, thanks? Yeah, so this is one of the reasons why um, complexity is very, very kind of fashion- seems very fashionable in academic literature at the moment, but um, people dealing with it in terms of like actual research, that's more tricky, um, I think, just because, um, yeah, where do you cut things off? So I, I l- used a kind of complexity paradigm to approach uh, my research for my PhD, and it got really, really messy because it, it you know, I realised that it was very difficult to, to, you know, separate my teaching from my personal life because teaching and, and is such a personal type of work. And so I would you know, be looking at all kinds of things uh, and interactions with colleagues and that kind of thing. And then what was really difficult was kind of making sense of that and working it back into something that can kind of be of use as, as a piece of research. Mm. And, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure whether I was really successful <laughs> doing that or not. Well, can, can you give us an example, maybe? So from your research, mm. can you give us a, an example of, of a, a way that you investigated some, something to do with language development or language learning using this complexity approach? Right. Yeah, well, so my, my research was focused on um, authenticity and motivation. And um, one of the... So my kind of basic kind of bottled definition of authenticity now is that it's a sense of congruence between action and belief so when you're you're truly authentic as a teacher if you're doing what you really believe um, you should be doing and you're actually able to do that so when your kind of philosophy of how education or how language learning and teaching should be done when you're really doing it then then you're kind of then you're authentic. Mm-hmm. And so I looked at uh, the relationship between teacher motivation and student motivation. Um, 
And so one kind of specific example would be uh, I created um, a kind of a sociogram of my students in the uh, classroom. So that was basically a drawing of all their relationships. Well, not all their relationships, actually, mm-hmm. because it was a drawing of uh, the relationships that I could, you know, that I was uh, aware of, which wasn't very many. So one thing that I looked at was uh, where did they sit? So because I'd been doing, i keep been keeping kind of a lot of notes, I had a little map of where the students would sit and so I could plot a kind of diagram of who sat next to who. And then the other relationships that I put in were who's in the same department. So then you got quite a different picture then. It turned out that not everyone from the same department would sit together. Mm. And some people would sit with other people from other departments. But then other people would sit only with people in their department. And then the other thing that I plotted was who worked together on group projects. So they had to do a video project and they had to do a kind of interactive presentation. And once all those, that's only four relationships, but once they were all plotted in, it was incredibly, uh, you know, crazy, complex-looking network diagram, um, like a sociogram. And using this diagram, I was able to, to really get a sense of there's so much going on in the classroom that I, as a teacher, might not necessarily have been aware of if I hadn't been really trying to sort of Uh, approach it from this kind of complexity perspective. So, for example, there was one student who used to sit right at the front who I thought was very highly motivated because he would would always sit at the front and always want to talk to me and he was very communicative. And then there was another guy who was always sitting at the back and he was kind of the opposite. And uh, when I did the sociograms, it turns out that both of these students were actually what's called um, isolates. So they didn't have very many connections within the group. And I was surprised to find that the first guy was, uh, was also an isolate, just like the guy at the back. So because that, he'd seemed very social and very connected to me, but he was only connected to me, uh, and, and he wasn't that well connected to other students. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So sort of realising that there was a similarity between these two students... Um, was very eye-opening for me. So that was kind of one of the things that I learned. Hmm. Do you think that um, if you hadn't have made your research in this manner, you would have missed out on those nuances or you would have reached other conclusions that you perhaps wouldn't have done yeah. otherwise? Maybe? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think I, I might have missed out some of the nuances uh, of my classroom. And, but, you know, the, the whole thing about the complexity paradigm is that I, I definitely did miss out on a lot of the nuances as well. So, you know, because the, the language classroom is, is obviously a very uh, dynamic and, you know, social place and there's all kinds of different things influencing those learners um, or as individuals at any one time. So really all complexity does is make me approach the classroom um, you know, with that kind of more holistic uh, view of it. And, and I try to see the learners as people and you know, imagine what kind of things are going on outside the classroom as well uh, and how they might influence my classroom. Okay, I see. And maybe uh, to, to sort of wrap up, um, what do you see as being the, the actual the practical implications of this complexity approach for teachers? Like, it's obviously very interesting for researchers, maybe it's interesting for people to understand their classroom, but what, what is the takeaway um, from this? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, and, and I've been asked that question uh, before, and I don't know if I was able to answer it all that well, to be honest, uh, because, um, yeah, I think one of the, as I said, the, the kind of suspicious or, you know, the, the people who don't like the sound of the complexity theory, um, maybe they think that it just uh, it just creates a barrier between teachers and researchers. But actually, my, my take on complexity is that it actually tries to empower uh, teachers more to, to do their own kind of research if the emphasis on this kind of paradigm is, to, is on classroom-based research and teachers doing their own research and... Mm-hmm. It's very retrospective, um, you know, the the data that you tend to look at, you, you look back on it. So it really, really highlights um, reflective practice and reflection, and of, uh, but of course evidence-based reflection, um, because, you, you know, you need to 
have something. It can't just be reflecting on assumptions and things. Mm -hmm. So like the assumption that I had made about that one student being, uh, you know, very social was actually, it turned out not to be true when I looked at the the diagram. So I think that it, yeah, to, to sum up, I think that it encourages us to reflect on the complexities of the classroom and to see it really as, as something living and moving all the time and not something that you can compartmentalise for research purposes. TEFL News. For today's TEFL News section, we're going to be talking about linguophobia, uh, in particular a story in The Guardian from the 28th of May this year, which is titled, British linguophobia has deepened since Brexit vote, mm. say experts. Um, so, first of all, what do you understand by linguophobia? What do you think that means? It was a new term for me. Um, well, when I think of that, I think of like... So there's been a lot of viral videos going around recently. There was one guy, like a restaurant worker, or somebody in a restaurant, complaining about these two Spanish speakers. Mm-hmm. In the States. Yeah, in the States. Mm. I mean, that guy was a racist, right? Full stuff. Like. Yes. But this is kind of an example of linguophobia. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I mean, I assume nobody's scared of language in itself, so I assume it's, it's a fear of, of languages other than your own, mm. perhaps. Yeah, so that, that was what I kind of assumed uh. Uh, from, the, from reading the headline. Um, and I, I think we can connect it towards this kind of fear or, or hatred, even, mm-hmm. or distrust of, of li- languages other than your own. Yeah. But it's, it's actually, the definition in this article is a little bit more... Um, I guess a little bit more subtle than that. Okay. So I'll, I'll just read a paragraph from the article. Uh-huh. Um, speaking at the Hay Literary Festival on Friday, a panel including Cardiff University professor Claire Garora and linguist Teresa Tinsley said that Britons had too long relied on a false belief that English was the world's lingua franca. Only 6% of the global population are native English speakers. I don't like the word, but... <laughs> um, with 75% of the world unable to speak English at all. But three quarters of UK residents can only speak English. Um, And uh, Garora warned that um, economic opportunities and bridge building with the rest of the world was at risk after Brexit if Britons did not become less linguophobic and learn more languages. So here, linguophobia is referring to the fear of learning other languages rather than the fear of other languages being present in your environment, I guess. Mm, Yeah. Mm. Um, So... Yeah, maybe it's a little bit counterintuitive, but is this something that you've noticed um, either when you were growing up, or perhaps have you noticed an increase in this? A fear of learning other languages? Yeah, or, or an aversion to it, maybe, in the case of the Britons. <laughs> Not really, no, I don't think so. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's, I guess there's general kind of, I don't know, well, well noted, maybe just only anecdotally, but general apathy towards learning other languages right, right. by so-called native English speakers. Um, and maybe that's connected to this belief, perhaps misguided, that you only need English to survive in this world. Mm. Do you think that is a misguided belief? Well, I mean, it depends on your context. I, you, of course you can get by learn, knowing any one language. <laughs> um, Do you think there's, it's more the fear that people think that languages are changing and and that they might have to change with it because mm. like the, people have been saying for a long time oh eventually we'll need more people will need to know Arabic you know mm. Chinese will Mandarin will become a dominant language and it's these kind of ideologies or discourses that maybe make people <coughs> a bit more scared or fearful for their yeah. For their sacred uh, English. I mean, I, w- I wonder if you could also extend the meaning of, of linguophobia to um, like learning the you know the uh, new the changes happening to your own language. Mm. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, so I I guess um, going back to the examples that you gave before Matt about uh, the the lawyer who was yelling in the the, the restaurant. Oh, was he a lawyer? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, who, who apparently speaks fluent Spanish. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But so. Uh, do you think that this that this is a different thing? Cause you, you, that was what came to your mind in terms of linguophobia. Here, it's the the apathy, as you said, or the aversion to learning foreign languages. Do you think they're, they're, that these are different phenomena, or just different strains of the same phenomenon? Hmm. I, d- I don't know. I know almost nothing about the um, bilingual issue in, I guess, especially the southwest part of the states. Mm-hmm. But I know it's an issue 
in terms of policies of, of bilingualism in schools, obviously English and Spanish. Um, and there's, I think, you know, maybe well-documented, well, well-known um, issues of, of language in the States in terms of, yes, yeah, speaking Spanish, obviously. Um, and I wonder if, maybe, maybe you could see some crossover in terms of people not wanting to have to learn Spanish um, to accommodate their, you know, neighbors and other people in their community, and then by extension, feeling annoyed or angry when they hear people in their community speaking Spanish. Mm. That what, makes sense. Yeah, what I just thought about as you were speaking then is, um, do you think this, the, this linguophobia is sort of manifested within language policy? Mm-hmm. Rather than on a, I guess it has two levels, right? On in the like street level, I guess local mm-hmm. public level, mm-hmm. but then also within like government right. level too. Right. And I, I mean the the, yeah. the anger that some people seem to feel, apparently walking down the street and hearing languages that are you know not native to their country, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. Um, is that does that where does that anger come from? Is it partly of, you know, infer- inferiority that I don't understand them and I don't, mm. I'm not willing to learn that language. I think it's or something else? fear that they're talking about you. <laughs> <clears throat> one of my um, one of my friends from school actually. I won't I won't out them, but um, uh-huh. but uh, I, I remember um, you only had one friend. From school, <laughs> so. Hey, all of my friends disagree with you. Um, they uh, yeah this 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 person was saying that um, and this was at at school you know uh, when I was a, a high school student. Um, he said yeah you know but it's it's really disconcerting to me walking down. You know, Derby City Centre, and not being able to hear a single British person speaking. I thought, <laughs> this is Derby City Centre in what two thousand and five. Mm-hmm. Like that wasn't happening. So I mean, like you, they were just selectively paying attention to only the foreign voices mm-hmm. because yeah, yeah, there was yeah. obviously something about that that bothered them. You know, yes. yeah, um, yeah. and I think people can understand that to an extent. You know, like changes in your environment, things that seem different and foreign are, are a bit sort of naturally scary to people. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you combine that maybe with what are what what appear to be sort of resurgent or prevalent sort of nationalistic attitudes? Maybe that uh-huh. leads us uh, more towards this this overt linguophobia. Yeah, in in ter- linguophobia in terms of of not wanting to learn another language. I think in, bo- in terms of both. both. Yeah. So yeah. it's not it's not that people are worried about having to. Oh no, I'm going to have to learn a new language. They're worried about their language losing dominance or relevance mm. Mm. to their local surroundings possibly i guess it's difficult to untangle whether it's people worried that like they're they're not learning a language because they're worried about uh, the state of their own language or not language not learning a language because they're so confident in the status of their own language <laughs> it could lead to the same result in either case i guess but i think that generally for the for some of these people that you talk about it's just it comes from a place of anger and fear mm. right right and also lack of knowledge yeah. but I, yeah i suppose it's you know if if i Okay, if I make if I decide I am going to learn this other language, then I'm kind of I'm letting them win. I'm 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 giving up. I'm saying my language is no is no longer the dominant language in this environment, and I'm I'm accepting that these other languages will come in. So, uh, I guess um, the question that our, our listeners might be asking is, what's this got to do with TEFL? Uh, because we're talking about people n- not wanting to learn languages other than English. Um, yeah. But again, so this is uh, a paragraph from the uh, the Guardian report. Um, the same report also found that there was a growing language deficit in the UK, which is expected only to grow post-Brexit, because the UK's £1 billion language industry, including services such as translation and interpreting, already heavily relies on EU citizens whose expertise may become harder to access. So I guess from the perspective of British teachers, um, this, this might be a bit of an issue if, if uh, the rest of the world is going to start relying on their own linguistic resources. Mm-hmm. But that might be kind of a good thing in terms of, you know, as we've talked about before, linguistic imperialism mm. and so on. What, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think the, the uh, English language, you know, business around the world is, is probably strong enough that it can take a few hits. Mm. Um, and like you say, if, if, it, if it does um, cut into the, the, the linguistic imperialism that is undoubtedly been a, a large part of the last you know, century or so. I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah. I think, like, as well as us being English teachers, I think we'd all, we, we're all we not against English losing its dominance either, right? Mm-hmm. See what I mean? We, yeah. In some ways it works against us, but in some ways we're, we're open and friendly to the idea of language changing too. Yeah, you mean we're just three 
really smart, open-minded guys. <laughs> but, but I see what you mean. They are at odds with each other. But we should. We're all. I think as 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 people that are interested in language, yeah, we should right, be right, open right. to that too. Yeah, I think. Yeah, whilst I, we have a job. <laughs> right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I, th- I guess the takeaway message is: keep being linguophobic, Britons. It just makes our political ideology ever stronger. <laughs> TEFL Pioneers. So this episode's TEFL Pioneer is Michael Halliday, um, who, as many of our listeners probably know, uh, died recently, um, a couple months ago, as we're recording this, on the 15th of April, uh, 2018. He died in Sydney, age 93, so not bad. Um, He was born 13th of April, uh, in 1925, in Leeds, Mm. the one in Yorkshire. (laughs) <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start with just some biographical um, information about Halliday before moving on to his work. Um, so first of all, full name, Michael Alexander Kirkwood Halliday, M-A-K, as he's often ah, referred right, to. Okay. I've always yeah. wondered what that meant. Okay. Uh, born and raised in England. His mother was Winifred. His father was Wilfred. Right. <laughs> his father was a dialectologist, a dialect poet. Mm. I'm not exactly sure what that is. Someone who writes poetry in a dialect. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Or about dialects? Oh, uh, no, in a dialect. Okay. Or I, both. I know that. Okay. Uh, so, some key dates. In 1942, he volunteered for the National Service's Foreign Language Training Course. Uh, he was selected, so I guess, I'm not sure how this, this training course worked, but he was selected to study Chinese. Mm. So, I imagine they, they would receive a bunch of uh, applications, and they'd say, okay, you're going to learn this, you're going to learn this. Mm-hmm. Um, Apparently, he was selected to study Chinese based on his ability to differentiate tones. Mm. So it's an interesting kind of screening process they did to decide which language you would go to study. Mm. Um, After 18 months training, he spent a year in India working with the Chinese intelligence unit doing doing counter-intelligence work. Oh, interesting. Counter-intelligence. Counter-intelligence work. Yeah, they're trying to make people stupid. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, just intelligence work. Well, I think it's the same thing, yeah. It's gain, gaining intelligence yeah, to, counter. to counter the other intelligence. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, people stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1945, he moved to London to teach Chinese. He took a BA honors degree in modern Chinese language and literature through the University of London, uh, which was an external degree that he studied for in China. He lived for three years in China. He studied at Peking University and Lingnan University mm-hmm. in Guangzhou. Uh, he then did a PhD in Chinese linguistics at Cambridge under Gustav Hallam and J.R. Firth, mm. to, to uh, sort of linguists of note. Yes. Um, from 1954 to 1958, he was an assistant lecturer in Chinese uh, at Cambridge. And then at that point, having basically being a language teacher for 13 years, he switched his specialization to linguistics. Mm. So he had this 13 years uh, grounding as, as just a language teacher. Mm. Um, from 1958 to 63, he was a lecturer in general ling- linguistics in Edinburgh. 1963 to 65, um, moved to the Communication Research Center at UCL. Um, he did a stint at Indiana University, went back to UCL, stint at Stanford, University of Illinois, uh, Essex University. And then in 1976, um, he went to the University of Sydney um, and as a professor of linguistics. And I think he started a few of their, their, their main linguistic center there. Uh, and he was there for quite a while. He retired in 1987 um, and awarded the status of Emeritus Professor of University of Sydney. Hmm. And yeah, he, he retired in 1987 from his professorship there, but he continued to, to publish and do work. Right, right. So that's the easy part of this uh, section. <laughs> uh, the tricky part now is to discuss his work. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to preface all this by saying, I you know, I tried to get my head around as, as much of this stuff as possible. And what I'm going to kind of present here is a very, very simplified version of, of his work, and which probably means a lot of it's wrong. And so any kind of, you know, real linguists out there are going to be shouting at their computers as they listen to this. They don't listen. Okay, that's true. <laughs> Good point. So, um, Halliday is best known for his Systemic Functional Linguistics, mm. SFL, um, which is an approach to linguistics that considers language as a social semiotic system. What do you think uh, social semiotics refers to? Well, semiotics refers to signs. Mm-hmm. Signs and signifiers mm-hmm. and like the way that, yeah, the way that things like 
<clears throat> the way that like a word links to its the way that a, a word as a signifier links to its sign mm. and that's the semiotic relationship right if I yeah. remember correctly yeah so it's, I mean it's basically a study of, of meaning making and the signs that represent those meanings yeah mm. yeah I yeah. think so <laughs> maybe <laughs> Um, so he introduced the, the, actually Halliday introduced the idea of social semiotics in his book, Language as Social Semiotic. Um, but he tried to explain language as meaning making, um, as a social practice. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So, or, or another way to put it is a resource for meaning across the many and constantly changing contexts of human interaction. Mm -hmm. So basically not separating this meaning making from the social situation, the social practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he also uh, social semiotics also talks about how meanings and, and, and semiotics are shaped by relations of power. So as power shifts in society, languages and other systems of socially accepted meanings can also change. Mm. And actually, I don't think he was so involved in it, but the the kind of direction that that social semiotics was taken um, really focused on this this kind of power dynamics and mm. that sort of critical issues. Um, yeah. So he so. Going back to the, this idea of um, systemic functional linguistics, um, first of all, he basically, when, when he talks about systems, he he's just talks, of, his, his version of system is just language, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, which is what he describes as a set of resources um, that, is, it's basically about choices. So at, at any given moment, when you're using language to express yourself, you're making a series of choices, and that's what makes it a system. Mm -hmm. okay. um, he also organized language in, his, in the three metafunctions that he called them. So the first metafunction is interpersonal. Um, this is facilitating social and interpersonal interactions. Uh, ideational, or ideational, I'm not sure, um, which is re representing ideas about the world, human experience, making sense of reality. And then finally, textual, um, which is connecting these interactions and ideas into meaningful texts within a specific context. Mm. Um, Robert Hodge, who's an Australian semiotician, um, kind of provided a nice summary that I found um, of Halliday's various essays on social semiotics. So he talked, uh, Halliday talked about language. He said language is a social fact, so in inseparable from social context. Mm -hmm. He also said, interestingly, we shall not come to understand the nature of language if we pursue only the kinds of questions about language that are formulated by linguists. Mm. And I guess he meant more traditional linguists. Right. Um, he said, language is as it is because of the functions it, is, it has evolved to serve in people's lives. Um, so th this is kind of moving on to the functional aspect of the, the functional the systemic functional was, linguistics. Just on that point there, was yeah. Halliday, was he one of the people who tried to sort of push for, what's it called, um, non-prescriptive grammar? Mm. So, descriptive and, grammar. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> dis yeah, descriptive grammar. So like the whole point about not listening to linguists, just yeah. linguists, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Fixed, fixed notions of grammar rules and that kind of thing? Yes, yeah, yeah. So he I, said, is yeah. actually, yeah, yeah, kind of another quote, he, he mentioned that language basically can't be equated with, you can't just say language is this set of gra grammatical structures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and you, you know, emphasize whether that be a finite or infinite, infinite set, mm -hmm. that's not what language is. Right. Um, you, it's, if you just look at language like that, you're not going to understand it. And I guess that links back to Richard's point earlier. Who is no longer with us? <laughs> <laughs> no longer. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> R.I.P. Between uh... no longer here. I mean, uh -huh. um, like language is a complex system, right? That's kind yes. of what they, this has kind of led towards, I guess. Yeah, that's Perhaps. that's a good point. Yeah. So so not just just focusing on the gram yeah. grammatical yeah. structures. Um, he he said the use of formal logic in linguistic theories is basically irrelevant to the understanding of, of language. Um, as you can maybe imagine, he. Um, I don't know, I, I didn't find any evidence of like specific clashes, but he, him and Chomsky were taking very different perspectives. Mm. Um, Chom Chomsky was basically looking at language as a theoretical construct. Mm. Um, so about Chomsky, he said, imaginary problems were created by Chomsky um, by, the, by, the, by basically like a series of dichotomies that mm. Chomsky introduced. Syntax, semantics, grammar, lexis, language, thought, competence, performance... 
And then his issue with what Chomsky was doing is that once these dichotomies had been set up, um, linguists had to spend a lot of time maintaining and locating the boundaries between them. Mm. And Halliday's perspective seems to be that none of this was actually useful for analyzing properly how language serves to, you know, mm. serves us mm-hmm. as, as so a form of communication. If we pick one of those dichotomies, uh, yeah. like performance competence, yeah. so competence would be the, uh, your, your innate ability to do language, I guess. Um, like you're, so uh, if, you, if you've grown up speaking a language as your first language, then you have complete competence in that language. But performance... Uh, is is your outward expression of that language, which doesn't necessarily match your competence, right? right? Yeah. So would Halliday be saying that that those two terms that there is no distinction between them? Is he saying that there is no innate cognitive structure, mm-hmm. no no innate grammar? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure, that but there I is, that there is only performance, in other words. Perhaps, yeah. I mean that that is a I, I don't know, I'm not sure to be honest, but that is a perspective I've. I've read mm-hmm. um, that you can only look at the performance, right? And you can only look at it, but it doesn't mean it's all that there is. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I'm, my guess would be that maybe they would be seen as kind of on a, not necessarily on a spectrum, but you know, um, two parts of a bigger whole, perhaps. Mm. Um, in terms of grammar lexis, so um, Halliday coined the term lexico grammar. Um, and he was very much not interested in, in, in distinguishing them completely. Obviously, he recognizes that you know you, you can look at them in certain ways separately, but that they're just you know two ends of a of the same line. Mm-hmm. Um, so the 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 functional side of of all this um, is basically that language evolves and, and develops only purely because of the the functions that the, this language system must serve. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. And so, I, again, I guess maybe that, that feel, feels to me like the link between the more kind of technical aspects and the social aspects mm. of the language. Um, finally, just in terms of his work, um, he did a lot of studies in child language development. Um, he, wasn't, he didn't like the metaphor of acquisition of a language because he felt that, view, that, that, put, that viewed language as too much just as a static product that, that could be acquired. Um, he instead um, looked at development as well focused language development as just meaning potential like mm. not acquiring obviously but developing your meaning potential um, and he identified um, different the specific functions that children were motivated to, to develop language in order to be able to do so instrumental expressing needs telling others what to do, forming relationships, expressing feelings, gaining knowledge, all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. For me, the really challenging part is, is kind of, and maybe this com- again comes back to the complexity theory, how, how, how a child or how anybody in society, for example, their desire to form a relationship, you know, how that's going to connect back to language, creating mm-hmm. these kind of formal aspects mm-hmm. to it. Because mm. mm-hmm. language, you know, regardless of whether or not we want to look at grammatical structures, does have some formal aspects. To it. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering about the the idea of uh, the language evolving. I mean, mm-hmm. is he talking about the the language? I mean, obviously, the language has to evolve with the people. It's a it's a semiotic symbiotic system in that <laughs> sense. Um, uh-huh. But I mean, like, does he does he put forward any kind of cognitive model for language, or is or is he just looking at how language manifests uh, I'm not sure to be honest mm. yeah I don't know okay <laughs> <That's a simple laughs> answer. Um, so j- just to maybe a couple things to maybe think about or to discuss so first of all what I was interested in was that was his his years as a language teacher before he he, he developed the, or I guess I think he was developing the, these ideas as he was being a language teacher mm. but do you think his experience as a language teacher may have influenced his views I think Probably, I mean, okay. it's, it sounds like it, especially if he's if he's focused on the manifestations of language and the use of language. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are the preoccupations of language teachers, really. Yeah. Like, like you know, Chomsky kind of famously said that his theories don't have any bearing on language teaching, mm-hmm. right? Um, and he's not interested in that. Uh, so I guess that the fact that Halliday spent his early years, you know, actually 
focusing on how language was used and encouraging people to use it in certain ways mm. would would influence the way that he viewed it as as it was used. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing to add. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What what influence, if any, do you think his work has had on kind of the on modern language teaching? Mm. Or, you know, any changes in language teaching over the last 20, 30 years? Well, it, it seems like he's had influence on on the way that we do sort of discourse analysis, mm-hmm. you know, looking at power, looking at the social, I guess, it, the social turn. I guess that's more of a more recent it's an thing, SLA I thing. Guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's probably influenced mm. that. And, uh, yeah, definitely mm. discourse analysis, the way that people observe the system of language within wider socio socio systems right, right. like power politics that kind of thing yeah. yeah i was thinking in terms of uh, things like pragmatics maybe you yeah. know the, the yeah. teaching of, of yeah. pragmatics yeah um if you if you if you want to teach language as it's used in different situations and if you want to teach the sort of ambiguity then then understanding uh, the you know the, the the kind of thing that Halliday sort of is very important, mm-hmm. whereas a, a Chomsky approach would focus more, I guess, yeah. on those sort of structures right. um, and developing underlying linguistic knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I guess that would that would be a, an influence. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe just you know an overall trend towards more a more communicative approach and in interaction hypothesis and that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. um, where you you accept that um, you know s- students need that kind of interaction to to be able to develop their skills yeah although the interaction hypothesis comes from well uh, you know it's, it's sort of part of a trajectory from Krashen which was very influenced by Chomsky <laughs> so. yeah. yeah yeah okay well uh, we had a shot at it that was uh, <laughs> this episode's TEFL pioneer Michael Alexander Kirkwood Halliday thank you very much for listening to today's episode and there's lots of ways to get in contact with us. You can send us an email at teflology at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter, at teflology. Uh, you can visit our website, that's teflology podcast.com. On there, as you probably know, we have all of our back episodes. You can go back and listen to them. And you can also find out more information about us. We also have a Facebook page. And um, <laughs> Matt's making the book symbol at me as well, which probably means that we, we have an ebook that we wrote. And um, we'd love it if you could buy it. Um, any, any purchases go straight back into making this podcast. So you'll be directly supporting the show. And yeah, the book itself is all about. Um, well, you'll, you'll see. You'll see. <laughs> um, go and check that out. Um, so it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from me. Goodbye.